future trends, deep insights, industry leaders. This is the iGaming Next podcast with your host, Pierre Lindt. Good afternoon, Paul. How are you? I'm very good. Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you're well. Very, very good, uh, uh, Paul. So uh, today is an emergency podcast uh, uh, here on the news that uh, Kindred have acquired Relax Gaming uh, to kind of uh, sort out their B two B offering uh, here, Paul. So uh, you know you're the uh, you're a partner of, of Regulus Partners, uh, of course. Um, you are writing a newsletter uh, that comes out from time to time when this news uh, happens, which I am just a massive fan of. So I just wanted to start by just uh, giving you a thank you. And, and for any viewer who is not subscribed to this newsletter, uh, definitely check out the uh, Regulus Partners and sign up for this. It's a free newsletter and uh, this gives fantastic insights. So, so uh, Paul, let's just uh, jump straight into it uh, here. Can you start by perhaps reiterating a little bit uh, of um, the insight that you have found so far in this uh, acquisition and why it's so interesting? Yes, yeah, sure, certainly. So Relax is a business which Kindred had already invested in, and therefore it had um, an important minority stake, um, which gives some level of um, leverage over how a business might be able to develop, as well as obviously a financial reward for the business doing well. Um, however, Kindred is now owning all of it, and we think that that is quite an interesting strategic and operational tightrope to, to, to walk, which isn't captured in only owning a third. So in the first instance, it's been made really clear that Relax is going to continue to be independent. It's going to continue to um, service its third party clients, um, and it's going to continue to walk its own strategic walk, which is a really powerful and important message um, for preserving the existing revenue. Inevitably, if the business is pivoted increasingly toward what Kindred wants, then there is a concomitant impact on the, on the revenue streams that can be generated from third parties. It's also, I think, important for the, for the relaxed team to know that they're going to continue to do what they want to do, um, hence agreeing to the deal. However, it's also been made clear that this is designed to give Kindred more control and a stronger ability to differentiate. So that means that at least some of that um, content, some of the development potential will be rooted into doing things which are exclusive to Kindred. So if you get the mix too far one way and Relax remains very independent, then essentially you just made a big financial bet on Relax continuing to be good. Um, but you don't get so much in the way of a benefit uh, from, from operationally, which is which is fine. But it's always dangerous when you have a, a, a small nimble business or even a small to medium sized nimble business. It's a 240 man FTE outfit being swallowed into a, a large business, which has got its own strategic um, goals and its, its own efficiency drivers. They're already talking about um, operating efficiencies. Most of it, though, will be simply that Kindred's paying relax already and now it's wooden dollars. But even so, you have a situation where there is going to be an increasing tendency for Kindred to say, we're at the top of the development queue. What we have to do is the most important thing that you have to do, relax, and therefore um, that's how we're going to position things going forward. So either they um, have a phenomenally efficient and really successful um, management team, which is possible, or increasingly the business gets um, flabby because you have dual development teams, the guys that are doing things for everybody and the guys that are doing things for, for Kindred, or you start squeezing that third party development team increasingly and, and positioning it toward what Kindred wants to do. So there are a number of risks in how, in how Relax gets managed and shapes out. And a lot of smaller content businesses have disappeared into big operators never to be seen again. So, so there, is, there is a clear risk, albeit Relax is bigger than most of those other acquisitions and therefore gap, gives it its own balance. It also has its own revenue to protect. And there's nothing like 25 million euros coming in to think, actually, we, we want to keep that, particularly with high operational gearing. Um, but that's another issue that we think is, is going to be quite interesting to see how it plays out. So 
two things to, to point out. First of all is that the last 12 months have been, on the whole, really good for games content because of COVID, um, as well as underlying growth. It means that um, there's, been a, there's been a boost in, in, in the number of people um, online gaming and in revenue share environment that flows straight through to the bottom line. And because it flows through to the bottom line quickly, you don't have to expand your cost base as you would in a normal slow growth environment where your revenue is going up, but your costs are going up too. The benefit of that is that all that revenue drops straight through to profit. And we've seen that happen with Relax. Now, there's three things that make us a little bit nervous about where we are at the moment, as well as the um, question mark over integration. One, we already know that, that Germany has changed its um, slots and, and gaming rules. It's now, as of yesterday, applied a 5.3% turnover tax, which means that online right. gaming, as we know, it doesn't work. Um, it has right. to be completely reconfigured. Um, or service the black market, which I suspect Kindred and Relax won't be comfortable in doing. So consequently, yeah. whatever amount of revenue is being generated from um, Germany takes up a significant beating and probably has a, a large development pipeline to reconfigure content that suits a much, much um, lower returns to player. Also, you've got the continued issues in Sweden where the uh, limits have been imposed on online gaming operators. You've got a um, new gambling act being passed in Finland to, to tighten uh, gambling regulation there, and, and the same in Norway, where also um, in the last couple of days, Norway has threatened Betson with cease and desist. Kindred had already been threatened with that in Norway. So the, the Nordic markets, as well as Germany, are potentially wobbly, and you've got that tailwind of COVID, which in some markets is going to start to normalize as retail opens up. Potentially also if we have some consumer difficulties with all the adjustments that are going to have to take place economically. So there's a bit of a danger that the last 12 months to May 2021 are sort of a peak trading period. Um, and right. maintaining that momentum or, or even maintaining that level of revenue is quite challenging. And in that context, when you've got a fixed cost base, that 10 million of EBITDA can, can contract really quickly. Right, right, right. So, so, so I think there are therefore a couple of issues that, 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 that are worth thinking about. That said, there is a really interesting open question about how, apologies if you can hear my son who's just- oh, that's okay. It's 2021 20, uh, now, Paul. This is, uh, this goes um, with the next part of Thank you. That you do. So, Go ahead. Um, there is a, he always sounds like he's being killed by somebody. It's quite, I assure you, no children are being harmed in making this video. Um, so the um, issue with um, trading and with integration is clear, but also there's, a, there's another big looming issue on the other side of the equation. And that is that you've got an increasingly complicated uh, consumer and regulatory world out there. Uh, consumers are becoming more discerning. Markets are becoming more localized. One size fits all on a number of levels, therefore just doesn't really work anymore, which drives the requirement for differentiation, which is difficult to do if you have a one size fits all outsource model. Um, yeah. And it's, it's quite hard to do if you say, well, in that case, what we want to do is go to operators that have got the capability, suppliers that have got the capability and scale to deliver us that level of differentiation, because by default, they want to deliver it to everybody. And if you're kindred and you're looking at evolution combined with NetEnt, combined with Red Tiger, combined with um, BTG, who's got the contractual power there? Right. It's like almost like Playtech used to be. So I think having some level of control is a sound defensive play, mm -hmm. as well as looking at all of the all of the potential growth options. And um, one of the points that we make in our, in our note is that one of the really interesting questions to play out over the next 12 months or so is, will other operators faced with this bifurcation of supply between really powerful entities on the one hand and, and more boutique studios on the other be thinking, we wish we, our leaders were connected to some internal resource here. Um, we don't know, but actually, Doing nothing in a context where you don't know is not always a good idea. 
And now Kindred can potentially have its cake and eat it. It's, it's got that control right. and that resource at a price that it can afford. It's a semi-inside deal, which partially de-risks it. And they can see how the world plays out moving forward. It might be a mistake in terms of valuation. It might be a mistake in terms of integration. But doing nothing might be an even more dangerous mistake because you can, you can always regenerate money. But you can't regenerate strategic flexibility. So, so I think that's a lot of those issues have been sort of percolating into, into why this deal has happened. Right. So, so to kind of to summarize a bit, I mean, the uh, the dynamics of the industry is changing significantly at the moment. As you're saying, the European market or or the northern European markets is potentially contracting. Uh, at the same time, there is these massive op potential opportunities in the US, uh, and. Um, uh, but also the U.S. is very uh, complicated market to uh, to operate in, and you know you could call it that it's potentially 51 uh, uh, potential markets. And um, what Kindred is doing here, it seems a little bit on a from a helicopter view, as if they are they are committing themselves to uh, to take themselves into a tier one uh, type of position uh, here by by uh, controlling. Uh, the 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 product and controlling the the, the relaxed gaming is uh, multi platform uh, and and content that they that they have so to say so uh, so yes yeah, so it seems that this is the move to make if you want to be an operator for the future could you uh, could you could you agree with that sort of fair statement to say is the dynamic becoming very complicated I think it could be. And I think that's one of the really interesting things about where we are now in terms of the development of um, gambling in general and online gambling in particular. And it's, it's not just a question of the US, it's, it's happening everywhere. Um, if you go back um, 10 years or so, you could treat Europe as broadly one market, not from a languages point of view, not from a payments point of view, but broadly speaking, you could have the same set of products um, and you're servicing those higher value early adopter customers who are first and foremost gamblers and and you know you could you could be a a a, a brand with a with a with, with a broad range of geographies being serviced by the same product and technology. Um, right. That is no longer true. As markets become more mature and more mass markets, as customers become more discerning and, and increasingly come right. from retail environments, people are looking for 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 more specific products and experiences. So, in a way, I think that the, 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 the subtle differentiation I put on, on this versus being a tier one is that almost you'd say you'd leave the tier ones to get along with being tier one. You'd, you always need them, but if you need them to do everything rather than just the really good value add, they're gonna, they've got a massive price advantage. Whereas, equally, it's always great to have a range of boutiques who are going to be really innovative and really small teams, um, but they may only get one or two successful games. And the, the aggregator model within Relax is about half of their, of their casino uh, revenue. So, so that's provided, and it's provided within, within Kindred anyhow. But it's that middle piece of what if you're not going to get um, the content that you need from a range of boutiques? In fact, what if you, you're not able to go to a tier one for a very expensive off-the-shelf solution or, or persuade them to do something but bespoke to you? And what if what you want is actually quite basic, like your suite of table games or your second and third tier of, of slot content? You don't necessarily want to be paying premium outsourced costs to get them to be good. But equally, you don't want them to be rubbish in third race. So I right, think to right, an right. extent that the, it's the, it's as the market bifurcates between super premium, super resource and interesting boutique with a sort of range of also rounds who are struggling taking up the rear, then actually having a modern, dynamic and effective content hub that you can control fills some of the problems that that stretching apart creates. Right. And you mentioned uh, evolution here earlier as well, which is uh, uh, obviously taking the, the spot at the, at the 2020s uh, uh, playtech in a sense, where uh, it's very difficult to operate uh, as, a, as an operator without uh, obviously signing uh, evolution. Um, some of the major operators, I think the, the revenue is some, something like 60 to 70% of the revenue is coming through their products of evolution. And um, while that can be great today, 
it could potentially spell uh, disaster in the future if evolution decides to push up the prices, right? And that is uh, a little bit, uh, you could say that partly this could be a response to the fact that you don't want to stand and fall on one supplier uh, if you are kindred as an operator. Uh, yeah. and, and in order to do that, you, you, you then acquire a company like Relax to, to be able to produce your own content or control the, uh, your own content, so to say. Yeah, and it's also possible that um, Relax, someone had offered Relax a large sum of money, which mm. Kindred thought, gosh, uh, that focuses yeah. the mind somewhat. Because if, yeah. if that partial pillar to our sort of control and hedge against the, 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 the ever marching success of evolution gets knocked away, then, then we, may, we may have a problem. And it's interesting, well, that it's, that it's Kindred of, of all operators who, in a different world, decided right. yeah. that spinning out their betting engine was a good idea. And in that different world, it, it, it was. It's, it, there's no doubt that, that Canvas has been a success. And it, it's hard to say, in a sort of counterfactual way, what would Kindred have looked like had it not done that? What opportunities might it have been able to deliver yeah. on had Canby remained in-house? Um, it, certainly, it certainly hasn't been a disaster. So in, in that sense, mm. no one needs to lose sleep and think, gosh, that was a terrible decision to spin out <laughs> Canby. Um, it could... But equal action in an environment where you're not going to control your key technology stack, almost almost by default, not like the way a betting engine is. Mm -hmm. You're right, going right, to have right. other relaxers that are third parties um, yeah. feeding, feeding what you do. Um, so it's, it's, it's an interesting dip back into vertical integration in an environment that is not on the face of it as structurally critical as your betting engine. But then, equally, um, there are some very clear pricing protections that, that Kindred's got with Canby. Um, it's still a, it's still the, 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 a, a founder anchor tenant in, in many respects. And by comparison, you look at the, the what's going on in the in the gaming space, and there is a clear and present danger that uh, the gaming supply chain becomes difficult for um, for operators. Yeah. So you can see why they've done it. But it is an interesting backdrop that this was the business that spun out its betting content. Yeah, yeah, exactly. The, the Kindred, of course, being the uh, uh, and, 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 um, one of the major sports book, uh, sports books uh, traditionally. Uh, I have a question as well, uh, Paul. If we uh, if we look into um, if we look at this from a US per perspective specifically, uh, um, you know, you, you could say that uh, I mean that's almost almost a trend that is emerging that the, the tier one kind of operators in the US are uh, choosing as a strategy to control uh, all aspects of their operations uh, internally rather than, um, uh, again, going to, to suppliers. We see that with DraftKings, obviously, uh, acquiring Espitec and, 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 and other uh, media houses as well. Uh, so how important do you think the future growth in the US and, and the Kindred's plans within it were to to come to this uh, come to this agreement, I, I think that they, they they must have been additive. I think it's always a danger to overplay the importance of the U.S. outside of stock market considerations. <laughs> um, companies do well to look at where their where their profits are. Um, right. Obviously, that's got to be balanced with with where hope and strategic growth is. Um, but the, 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 by far the most important thing to consider is, is, is what's happening um, in, the, in the core markets that generate all the revenue and all the profit. It's, this is not a case of meanwhile in Europe. This is, this is, a, this is a, an overwhelmingly European business. However, you're, you're right that there is an important US dimension. And the US is at its uh, most likely to be profitable where there is a gaming element. There is not yet a clear path to profitability with, with betting alone. Um, now, in that context, all the additional hurdles that you have to jump through to be a regulated provider means that there are a relatively small number of gaming providers currently um, who have considerable pricing power. And you can guess who one of them is. Um, there are others, but it, it, you, you keep coming back to the big beast in the room. And so having your own ability to do that 
um, is potentially really important because one of the issues that, that America faces, or the USA faces, more than nearly any other jurisdiction or market, is that the number of uh, stakeholders involved in the variable cost base tends to be higher. Even though outside of Pennsylvania you have optically attractive tax rates, if you have to do access deals, then, and on top of that, you've got a whole bunch of marketing to do, um, then, then actually you've got a, the more you can reduce your variable cost base, the greater the likelihood is you can make some money off mid-scale. Whereas if you have a massive variable cost base, then the amount of revenue you have to generate to clear your fixed costs and actually make some proper money becomes way, way higher. It's logical enough. It's literally the opposite of Relax's model, where going from 15 to 25 million of revenue turn their EBITDA from a, less than a couple of million to 10 million. So you have, this, have the opposite problem in the US. Therefore, if you could own your own content, you're taking away a layer of variable cost. And in an environment where each layer of variable cost takes you further away from profitability, that's absolutely a good thing. It's true everywhere, but it's particularly true in the US. Right, right, right. It seems the, that the, the US is emerging as, as, a, as a market only for the tier ones, essentially, uh, both on the B2B and the B2C side. Is that a fair statement? Or can you still be a kind of tier two operator, do you think? I mean, uh, and just go into kind of single states and um, focus, uh, focus it, more on, the, on that front? It yeah. depends on what you want. I think if you set your stall around an enormous totally addressable market, and you've said that this is going to be the next big thing for our business, and your business happens to be quite large, then going into a small market in a small way doesn't move the dial at all. Oh, right. So it's the danger of, if you've set your strategic stall to do a certain thing, it's quite difficult to row back and say, actually, we didn't mean that. What we meant was we were going to take selective potential operational benefits where we can where we can find them in, 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 in different markets and we're going to monetize markets effectively where we have an edge and that might not be very big but over time it'll add up and it means that we don't hose a load of money in the meantime hmm. uh, one or two operators are saying that right now but, but nor many because it doesn't sound very exciting so yeah. and in that context can you be a tier two operator well it's it depends what you mean by operator so if you can stitch together a tier two offer with smaller suppliers and an incumbent who might be a smaller regional casino or it might be a tribal casino, something or a race course, race track, something like that. So that there are opportunities. I think what the, 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 the evolution of the market has demonstrated though in the particularly from a betting led standpoint is before product differentiation really bites, and we're not there yet. Customer access and marketing dollars is what matters. And if you look at customer access and marketing dollars, and then you're going up against FanDuel and DraftKings, then you're, you've got to be a tier one operator, because otherwise you don't have the resources. But that also belies an issue, because if you look at the total addressable markets that people are coming up with, and we've got strong views on those maybe for another time, then Actually, in each individual market, there are windows for smaller operators. And because it's a federal state that has a lot of different players in different markets, as well as some similarities, those small operators are different in each market, which means you can have a long tail that is far more dynamic and far more individually successful. So for example, like Europe, 10 years ago, would be win have looked at Superbet or STS and thought, gosh, those are really good businesses. <laughs> but look at Poland and Romania now and where's Bwin? Right, right, right. They like behind, yeah. Mm. Yeah, 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 interesting. In, in, interesting that I might, like, like I said, it seems, um, 
the, the, like the, the, the investor from investor point of view, the markets are obviously have high hopes that the US market is going to uh, kind of conquer the world in some sense with uh, DraftKings uh, valuations. Uh, I think the uh, market cap is 20 plus billion uh, USD at the moment. And obviously they are not looking at profitability for another uh, couple of years. Um, extremely high CPAs being paid out uh, in, in that market, which uh, just makes it very even more difficult than to be a, a tier, two, tier two operator kind of uh, to go head to head with that. Um, at the same time, you know, when you look at below the tier ones, uh, let's say the, the Kindred, for example, the, the Leo Vegas, the Betson, for example, just to give some context here, I mean, it seems that those type of operators are choosing slightly different, uh, uh, different strategies to each other. Um, Leo Vegas just announced recently that they are now uh, entering the US after have been saying for a long time that they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas uh, Betson is, uh, is entering as a B2B with their sports book uh, and they're being very careful on, on, the, on the B2C side. Uh, all three companies in this case are listed organizations and I think all three are well, very well aware that um, it's an investment that comes for several years to, uh, in order to potentially reach profitability. And, um, potentially having to sacrifice some EBITDA in the meantime, how are shareholders going to react to that? Um, what, what do you think uh, here, Paul, uh, you know, of, of these uh, tier kind of two operators, uh, if you will? Um, it's not a straightforward decision to go into the, into the US and, uh, and uh, Kindred obviously going very ag aggressive into the US mm -hmm. investments. Uh, is, it a, a, uh, is it a straightforward kind of when to uh, to just go head first into the into the US, or do you think that there is some reason behind what kind of that well, song particularly have done, for example, more on the B two B side? I think to a large extent, um, it's quite difficult to justify to a shareholder base why you want when operators and suppliers with UX exposure have much higher multiples. Um, so in a way, you kind of have to which is a rubbish right. reason to do anything, but it's a very effective reason nevertheless. Um, right. and, and actually, the, the, the gap in between attempt and failure, you've potentially got some very attractive paper which you can use for M&A or other purposes. So it's no bad thing to, 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 to wave the stars and stripes occasionally. That right. said, right. I think that there are essentially two models that have a logical sense of working from an outside standpoint. So assuming that you are not a US incumbent where it's a completely different ball game um, and treating FanDuel and, and, and DraftKings as kind of outsiders, because even though they're US companies, they're not part of the regulated infrastructure. So either you have a view that winner takes all and that the US is going to be completely different to everywhere else and that once you've got as many customers as possible and you've got captured all the early mover advantage, then you're gonna get customers that are sticky. You're gonna make the, the ability to compete against you as an operator so much more difficult because your marketing budget grows with your revenue, your customer knowledge, your um, product keeps advancing. And therefore the gap between you when you just started and you three years hence is, is enormous from a, from a technical and operational capability standpoint as well as marketing scale. And there is some merit in that. My, my concern with that approach is that it's never worked anywhere else ever in the history of gambling. Now, <laughs> the US might be different. And there are some reasons why it will be different, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a dynamic that is quite high risk, but it's also sufficiently high reward that if you play it out, what else would you do for DraftKings and FanDuel, just ignoring that FanDuel is part of Flutter, and then looking at FanDuel from a purely sort of US centric perspective, to say, do you know what? We're going to try to make money. We're going to try to make some profit. How? When DFS isn't profitable, when digital sportsbook is not obviously profitable, what's the purpose of constraining their market share now? What, what, th th they might as well, you know, go hard rather than go home. But right, that then creates the economic environment that makes it extremely tough for everybody else while these highly well capitalized uh, and, and high profile brands are going hard in the sports environment, which is small compared to everything else. But there is still gaming. Businesses can make money 
from gaming. And we've already seen profitable gaming businesses emerge already. Yeah. So that's where I think if you're a, a uh, even a kindred, which I know is people consider as betting led, but it's got a decent gaming franchise, and in a lot of areas, its gaming does better than its betting. It's kind of skewed by France in terms of its uh, overall um, mix. And certainly, Leo Vegas is overwhelmingly gaming. It's totally gaming led. If you look at the US gaming market, you're not thinking, should I go in or not? You're probably thinking, why on earth didn't I go in early? Because actually, this has been where all the money is. Now, yeah. who knew whether that would still be the case without COVID? Probably, not as much, but probably. Um, and now there are some markets that are damn near impossible to get into, like, like Pennsylvania. And the number of additional gaming markets is really fraught with political risk in terms of everyone assuming that more will come, but it's, it's not as simple as that. So I think that there is a, a very difficult discussion about how do you break into betting as things stand now, but there won't be going forward because going forward, the product edge will, will prevail. Right, right. Um, right. But we're not there yet. And in gaming, there is already a functioning, profitable market to tap into. The, yeah, the, the, right. the conundrum is if a lot of the gaming traffic is coming from betting, how do you square that circle without then cratering your underlying economic promise from your from your gaming offer? So there are still some issues, but it's it's not looking at the US in the round misses some of the important nuances which create significant pockets of value. Right, right. Interesting. Uh, so to, to start running thing, uh, things off uh, here, Paul, a little bit, I want to go back just to the, um, to the valuation itself uh, of uh, relaxed gaming. The, uh, the markets reacted very positively to, uh, to the acquisition, uh, the news this morning. I think uh, Kindle stock is up uh, in the green of uh, around 7.5% uh, uh, in, in this very moment. Um, the, uh, we mentioned before here that the, uh, in the last 12 months, uh, relaxed gaming have generated around 25 million euro in uh, revenue and uh, of that 10 million is uh, is EBITDA basically the pure profit um the uh, the valuation here is uh Kindred is paying up to 320 million uh euro what, what do you think of the uh, of the valuation uh, to this deal is it uh, on the higher end so to say not 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 really so it's it's five times the initial value which includes the element that Kindred already owns so Actually, it's a it's on the reason it, it's a deal that would have looked expensive two years ago, but looks cheap now. And I think that's because the multiples have just been very high uh, no, no, in, in no, since absolutely. COVID, essentially. Yes. And I think that that's one of the reasons why there's this extra 113 million on the table, and there's talk of 320 million of, of, of theoretical total enterprise value, which contains a chunk of money that's Kindred's already. So it's wooden dollars. Um, so I think that it is a, it is a well-structured deal, not very well explained in the press release, but a well-structured deal to get a business at a valuation that makes sense for its current profitability, um, and makes sense in terms of benchmark comps where you can promise a big earn out and depending on the mechanisms of the earn out, earn outs are easy to promise. And if the business does really, really well, you don't mind. The only danger with an earnout is the business does really, really well, and your underlying business goes backwards. Um, but this is too right. This is too small, really, in the scheme of things for for Kindred to worry too much about that dynamic going wrong for them. So they would probably be happy to pay out the earnout on, on whatever the metrics are, on the assumption that the, the, the company has done what it needs to to earn the earnout. So the initial. Um, enterprise value of 150 million looks looks reasonable. As I say, particularly given a big chunk of that is Kindred's wooden dollars, so it doesn't matter. They they get the valuation benefit of having invested early. Really? So so in that context, a a bigger question for the valuation than the current price is to what extent is that EBITDA a an EBITDA made up of COVID, Germany, and Nordic businesses that are all going to get squeezed. Or is it an EBITDA that's going to grow? Because the, if, the, if, the, if the EBITDA grows, then it unlocks the earn out, happy days, everyone's, everyone's happy. If the EBITDA stays the same, kind of doesn't matter. 
because you've paid your input price. It's self-funded. It's a, it's, a, it's a reasonably attractive price because of the level of operation. Yeah. If the EBITDA crunches back down to a couple of million or one million, that's a different matter. That's that a problem. Said, yeah. Go back to those strategic points at the very beginning. If it is strategically sensible for Kindred to be able to own and uh, this 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 content and technology capability, then there isn't really anything bigger they can buy. And if, if there is, it's a ton more expensive. So all of those risks get magnified and it's external. So the risks get magnified, not only in terms of cost, but actually all the money leaves. Kindred doesn't get to keep some of it. And then um, on the other side, if you buy something smaller, if you buy a tech team of 50 people, that will be dis that will disappear into the bowels of Kindred's HR, and they'll never be seen again. So right. finding the business that, that is just right to be able to integrate, but also to have the, the ballast and the bulk to, to continue to be as independent as necessary is, is quite difficult too. And if once you've decided upon all of those factors that actually this is the right thing to do, valuation is kind of irrelevant. I mean, so long as it's not completely wacko, no one's going to go back in five years' time, and no one ever does. Everyone pours over valuations when deals happen. How many times do you see investors or analysts pouring over the valuation of, 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 of the deal that had been done five years ago to work out whether it was any good or not? <laughs> it's it, it no, stops being news. The, the deal yeah. was, is good or not based upon the execution. Yeah, right. Right, right, right. Yeah, that that's a, that makes total sense. I mean, from uh, Relax Gaming's point of view, this must be uh, just the perfect time to make an exit. In other words, so what you are saying, as uh, as the markets are contracting, uh, obviously, uh, uh, Relax uh, Gaming have limited uh, capabilities to grow uh, uh, potentially in other jurisdictions. And uh, from Kinder's point of view, this is uh, then a good timing to to make this acquisition in order to uh, to then protect and control uh, the various aspects of their of their business, but. The risk lies now within Kindred, essentially. But we like gaming couldn't have found a better timing to uh, to create this deal. That is the, uh, the that that would be like the summary of this, you could say. Mm. Yes, agreed. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Paul. It's been uh, fantastic to, to have you on here on super short notice. I uh, really appreciate that for this uh, emergency podcast. Um, really nice to get in touch with you. And, and again, I just want to remind the, the people who are watching, uh, like, please check out the Regulus Partners uh, email uh, newsletter. It is absolutely fantastic. It's great insight. I uh, reference uh, the, the Paul's newsletter all the time on the podcast and, and, and elsewhere. So uh, please check it out. And um, yeah, I wish you all the best in the heat uh, here, Paul. And uh, just to uh, remind everyone again that uh, no children were harmed during this <laughs> the recording of this podcast, as you mentioned, Paul. Happy to hear that. And, uh, Sorry about that, all that noise. And thank you very much. Uh, that's, that's fantastic. Have a great weekend. And you. Goodbye.